Good day everyone. Today, we will be reviewing the SIF components for the high voltage or BAT transformer earthing process. This was the resilience initiative for 2021 that was undertaken by Vishal, Ronald, Ravel, Justin, Sabita, and Steve. We hope that this project will be meaningful to all listening and contribute to a safe future for all TGU employees. Before we begin, let's look at a short introductory video that explains the concept of serious injury and fatality and the important role employers have to play in its prevention. What's the worst that could happen? For safety professionals, thinking about that question is part of the job. It's important to think about because the worst workplace accidents can result in life-altering injuries or even death. In 2020, a worker died from a work-related injury every 111 minutes. It's important to think about because the rate of serious injuries and fatalities, or SIFs, is not decreasing as quickly as the rate of overall injuries. In response, safety leaders are taking action against the hazards that have the potential to cause life-changing impacts to their workers and their operations. Companies can take stronger steps to protect workers against the most serious incidents and the worst consequences. Many SIFs occur in these five high-risk non-roadway categories. Working at elevated heights. Confined spaces. Electrical safety. Lockout tagout. And industrial vehicles and equipment. A strong SIF strategy plays an important role in helping prevent serious injuries or deaths. And this has benefits that go well beyond keeping people safe. What are you doing to prevent serious injuries and fatalities in your operations? From that video, we have seen why it is important for employers to implement strategies to prevent serious injury for workers in those high-risk categories. We will now look at a brief history of serious injury and fatality. Let's begin by firstly defining what an SIF is. Put simply, an SIF is a life-threatening or life-altering work-related injury, illness, or one that results in death. The history of analyzing SIF goes back to 1931 where Herbert William Heinrich, an associate superintendent of an insurance company, developed the Heinrich's Pyramid. This pyramid was based on the study of over 75,000 industrial accidents. Heinrich showed that for every 300 accidents, there were 30 accidents with minor injury and one accident with a serious injury. The Heinrich Pyramid was developed further by Frank E. Bird in 1966. Bird analyzed over 1.7 million accidents for over 300 companies and developed the Bird's Pyramid. These two pyramids laid the foundation for workplace injury determination and prevention. However, not all events identified in the pyramid have the potential to cause a SIF event. A SIF potential event is one in which the result could have been worse if not for one factor. Therefore, a new subset of the pyramid can be determined. These SIF events are also associated with certain precursors. SIF precursors are high-risk situations in which management controls are absent, ineffective, or not complied with, and will result in a serious injury or fatality if allowed to continue. Now that we have a foundational understanding of serious injury and fatalities, let's turn our attention to the transformer earthing process. Now, let's review some basics of the facility. TGU has eight high-voltage transformers in total. The purpose of these transformers is to step up the voltage output from the generators to 220 kV for distribution to the grid. During outages, a flexible earth is needed on the high voltage side of this transformer. These earths will safely conduct any induced voltages to ground, thereby protecting the maintenance worker. Before earths are applied, the transformer high voltage lines have to be tested and confirmed to be dead or have no voltage. A man lift and a man lift operator are required for both the earthing and testing phases as a result of the height of the transformer. As you can already see, there are many things that can go wrong in this process. In other words, there are many avenues for an SIF to occur. 
Determining these SIF potential events was done by, firstly, finding out how the earthing is actually performed in the field. Now, who better to ask, than the lead and senior operators themselves? Feedback from this group was used as the work as performed. After the group analyzed the work as performed, they determined two serious injury and fatality events. These were, falling from heights and electrocution. Falling from heights is an ever-present danger to persons performing the earthing. This is because, operations personnel are required to be lifted in the air to perform the earthing. The employee will remain on the man lift for the duration of the task. The current fall protection policy dictates that fall protection should be used when working at heights greater than 6 feet from a lower level. However, PPE is considered to be the least effective in the hierarchy of controls in terms of business value and control effectiveness. Since the employee remains in the man lift for a significant time during the earthing, the potential for the individual to fall at that height and cause a serious injury is significantly increased. Electrocution can occur during the testing phase of earthing process. For instance, if there is a malfunction of the man lift or an incompetent man lift operator, then the employee will come into contact with an overhead energized line. In addition to this, electrocution can also occur if the line becomes energized during the earth application phase. Now that we have identified these SIF events, let's look at the precursors that were determined to be associated with these events. Management controls seek to reduce the occurrence of SIF events. However, feedback obtained from the survey suggested that there are gaps in the management controls that can lead to such an event. Firstly, there was no standard operating procedure for the earth application, even though this was a process that was done several times in the past. With the lack of any operating procedure to guide the operators when performing the earthing, there is an increased probability of a serious injury occurring. In order to reduce this, a standard operating procedure was developed and was included in the final reports of mission. Secondly, operations personnel lack the necessary training to inspect the man lift prior to performing the task. Since the use of the man lift is an integral part of the earthing process, it is essential that training be provided in this area. Thirdly, there was insufficient manpower available to perform the earthing. Assistance would usually be given by the man lift operator. However, earthing is not a responsibility of the man lift operator and therefore they cannot be depended on to perform this task. The use of additional labor will have to be discussed by individuals at the management level and their decision communicated to the operations staff. Fourthly, the weight of the flexible earth poses a safety risk for persons performing the task. Therefore, single-strand flexible earths can be procured. This will overcome the difficulties associated with the weight of the three-strand and enable a safer earthing process. Now that we have looked at the SIF events and precursors, let's turn our attention to the group's recommendations to prevent serious injuries in the future. The first recommendation made by the group was the incorporation of drug testing for the man lift operator. A drug test, taken within three months, is usually submitted by the contracted company. However, this test may not be reflective of the sobriety of the operator at the entrance of the facility. Due to the hazards present in the earthing, it is necessary that the man lift operator be deemed competent to operate the man lift. Therefore, a drug test will be an additional layer of defense to prevent a serious injury or fatality occurring during the earth application. Furthermore, a scissors lift can be used to perform the earthing as opposed to a man lift. In the event of a failure of the hydraulic system, the man lift bucket has a possibility of tilting over but the scissors lift will only return to its start position. As a recommendation to improve the workflow process, it is suggested that the last man lift inspection document as well as the man lift operator certification be provided to the operations department in advance of the day of the earthing. This will allow sufficient time for the lead operators to review the certificate and checklist to ensure that it meets their requirements. Any issues with the documents can be identified and addressed before the earthing to prevent time delays on the day that the earth is to be applied.
The group also recommended the use of an event-based decision tree to analyze incidents that occur in the facility. This approach is based on the fact that certain events are associated with a higher proportion of precursors. These include confined space, lockout tagout, pinch points, vehicle collisions, working at heights, arc flash and barricades or suspended loads among others. If an event fulfills any of these requirements, then it is deemed as having SIF potential. If not, then it is deemed as not having SIF potential. In this way, more resources will have to be allocated to those event with serious injury or fatality potential. Let's look at a simple example. In this example, an employee almost falls from the man lift during the testing phase of the earthing as a result of the man lift colliding with another vehicle. Do you think this will have serious injury or fatality potential? Let's see what the event-based decision tree says. According to the decision tree, this incident will fulfill two categories, working from elevation and vehicle collision. Therefore, from the event-based decision tree, this event will have SIF potential. We see how easy it is to determine serious injury or fatality potential events from the event-based decision tree. It is the group's firm belief that this will be an important inclusion in the company's incident review system. Suggestions were also made for the use of additional manpower during the earthing as well as the construction of a mechanical earth switch. This earth switch can be activated via a push button instead of the operator having to apply a flexible earth. A new JSA was also developed that included the new risk assessment matrix. In this JSA, the steps were grouped into three sections, mobilization of tools and equipment, application slash removal of flexible earth, and demobilization of tools and equipment. Controls identified were maintaining a safe distance from the high voltage lines, use of a safety harness, inspection of tools and equipment and the use of proper lifting techniques, among others. A standard operating procedure was developed that included a pre-check section. Included in this section were inspection of the tools required for the earthing, inspection of the man lift buckets, tires, movement alarms and restraining devices, among others. Once these checks are okay, the operator can then proceed with the steps to perform the earthing. The group would like to thank the management team for the feedback obtained on the project as well as the items that were actioned. We would also like to thank everyone for their attention and for the opportunity to present today.